it's got to be one of the most well-known stories. It's one of the most exciting stories um, in the Old Testament, Noah and the flood. And of course, it's found in chapter six. And I'm looking at uh, verses five, six and seven. And it says this. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Kind of sounds a little bit like today. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. It grieved him. God had grief. We grieved God. I mean, that's an amazing statement, isn't it? And no wonder because God had made the world with tender care and attention to every detail. And now he's talking about destroying it because of what man's done. It's an amazing thing. Goes on to say, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Everything had to go, didn't it? Everything had to be wiped clean off the face of the earth. Everything had to go because man is intimately connected with the world. The two are interconnected. And if man is evil, then the world suffers. If man's relationship with God is wrong, then the world can't function in the way that it should. That's the problem here. So God has to remove it all. Now look into the next chapter, chapter seven and verse one. And it says this, it says the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Fancy having God say that about you. Thee have I found in all this generation to be righteous. What an amazing man Noah must have been and how wonderful it must have been to hear God say that. In all the world, God could only find one man, Noah, who was righteous. But through this one man, the entire world would be repopulated. But just think, just think before we go on, just think for a moment, the amount of significance that there can be in a human being, that there is in a hum human being, that there is in every one of us. Because God says, there's all the world here, but I'll cast the world away, I'll destroy the world. But on this side, I have this man, Noah. And it's almost like God says, I'll cast that away, but I'll keep this treasured man. Why? Because, well, I mean, apart from his his love for Noah, and Noah was righteous, God had put the world into Noah's heart. Because God has put the world into all of our hearts. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. It's an astounding thought. We'll look at it a little bit closer, a little bit further on what that means that God has put the world in our hearts. Now we go on in the same chapter, chapter 7, and look at verse 11 and 12. It says this, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, I love the preciseness of scripture, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Two things happened there, the windows of heaven and the great deep broken up. The rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Just think of that. That was over a month, well over a month, a month and 10 days or whatever. Not only did the water pour down in thundering torrents from above for well over a month, but the vast reservoirs of the water that were contained and still are contained within the earth, they were released in great powerful fountains for over, over a month. So rain from above, water surging up from beneath. And it goes on to say, verses uh, 19 to 24 in that same chapter, the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven, they were all covered. 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living thing was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. 
And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. The rain ceased to thunder upon the roof of the ark, and Noah and his family, I imagine, they opened a window and looked out. And what they saw must have filled them with horror, horror and amazement. Where there had been cities and farmland was just heaving water. The waves, the water spread from horizon to horizon. Desolation, nothingness, tohu vavohu, just as it was in the beginning. Absolutely nothing. The world had disappeared. The world he knew was gone. Everything was gone. The green hills, the lush valleys, they were all gone. The lofty mountains and the forests were gone. The fields of barley and wheat waving in the wind, all gone. Fruitful orchards and forests and vineyards, they were all gone, disappeared, all lying beneath tons and tons of heaving water. We can't imagine the horror that they must have felt in looking out at this world. Gone were the streets, the shops, the libraries, the gymnasiums and even the cemeteries. Gone were the weddings and the celebrations and the sound of children playing in the streets. The sound of birds singing and dogs barking. All gone. Everything had become nothing. Ecclesiastes 1-2. All is vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. It had all become nothing. I can't imagine how that must have affected Noah and his family. But God was with him. Hallelujah. God was with him. Now the reason that God resorted to such extreme measures has many layers. The obvious one is we know that it was because of the wickedness of the people. He had to destroy the people because of their wickedness, their licentiousness, their perversions, their idolatry and child sacrifice that usually goes with that, their thievery, their cruelty, their hatred and violence, their arrogance and their selfishness, and on and on and on. But there was something else. We need to look a little bit deeper. There was something else, something that lay at the root of all that wickedness. Because they probably didn't set out to be wicked. People rarely do set out to be wicked. They just become wicked sometimes. How does this happen? They succumbed, I believe, to the superficial. They were shallow. They looked only on the surface of things and forgot the purpose of why we are here, why God had placed them in the world. They forgot that purpose. We're here to discover God and to find him in all things and to love him with heart and soul and mind. They probably loved the world, the beauty of the world, and they certainly appreciated its pleasures. God had placed this in their hearts, as he has done since the beginning of the world. Ecclesiastes 3.11 I have put the world into men's hearts. Loving the beauties and pleasures of the world wasn't the problem. What then was it that led to such wickedness that deserved annihilation? The answer is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, a fascinating verse, profound verse, written by Solomon, the wisest of men. It says this, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. It's a very cryptic verse. Let me paraphrase it. God has put the love of the world into man's heart in order that he shouldn't discover the plan of creation that God made from the beginning to the end. Now, I'll try and explain what it seems to me to be saying quite clearly. Actually, once you, once you 
un unpack it, so to speak, you can see exactly what Solomon was getting at. And it's this. It's a fascinating thought, actually. God hid himself. And not only hid himself, but he hid his purpose in creation behind, so to speak, the natural world. So we see the natural world and God is behind it. And the purpose of his creation is also behind there. Why does he hide behind creation, behind things? Why does he do this? It's to prevent man, this verse says, it's to prevent man from discerning the face of God by mere scientific analysis or artistic appreciation. It's unavailable for man. A scientist may be curious to discover the secret and the meaning of life. We often hear this, don't they, don't we? In our day, they're looking for what they call the singularity, searching for what is behind it all. And God says it's hidden. You will not find it out because it's only available to those who have a relationship to God. Man has to seek a relationship with God before he can discern the presence of God and the wonder of his purpose in creation. Love for God was and is and ever shall be the key. Not scientific scrutiny, not even artistic love for God's world. It's unavailable because there's the arrogance of man that, that, that causes that, that, that um, empowers that. Man in his arrogance wants to seek, wants to find the secrets. And God says, you, you won't find out that way. Love for me and a relationship with me. And by the way, that relationship with God begins through his son, Jesus Christ. And when we get that right, we enter through the way of Jesus Christ. We enter into this relationship with God and we discover oh, the face of God. We enter into a relationship of love with God and we begin to see his eternal purpose for this world. And it's so exciting. And it's where the, these antediluvians, these pre-flood people, this generation went totally wrong because they became enamored with the things they could see the beauty of the world because God had put that beauty in their heart he would put the world into their hearts but it was so that they would seek him in relationship but I'm jumping the gun let's go on in other words the beauty and the order of creation was a test it was a test for mankind the test was this will men become captivated by all the loveliness or in the astounding, amazing symmetry of all creation and in the pleasures of life? And will they forget why God has put them here? Would they sell themselves, as it were, cheaply, preferring the creation to the creator? To the generation of the flood, the enticements of beauty and pleasure became an end in themselves. Their lives became filled with the clutter of loveliness and pleasures. The beauty of a tree, a mountain or a river, the pleasures of eating and drinking and all the other pleasures of life. They became, their lives became cluttered with that and they forgot the reason why they were here. And they were so busy. Busyness can shut us out from God. We're always working, building bridges and monuments, planting orchards and forests, living hard and playing hard, begetting large families and competing with their neighbours to be the top dog. And there was one thing missing, and the lack of it precipitated them in inevitably, inevitably into a morass of wickedness. It always does. A shallow view of life ends up in a wicked life. The only thing that really mattered was that they should pursue God and in relationship to him, they would understand his purpose for creation from the beginning to the end. Hallelujah. But they had beauty and pleasure without purpose. Such a life degenerating into tastelessness and dissatisfaction demanded more and more perverseness in order to thrill everything everything fizzled away 
into nothingness, giving less and less satisfaction to them. Now think of shallowness. All society was shallow, and out of its shallowness sprang wickedness. Again, I'm mindful of our own generation, a shallow generation that is becoming wicked. It always does, you know, shallowness leads to wickedness. There is nothing more profound than seeking God and appreciating and loving Jesus. You see, people don't set out to be wicked, but they wallow in shallowness and wickedness is the inevitable product. It's a one-way pipeline. Shallowness, denial of God, meaninglessness, dissatisfaction, despair, violence, judgment. Always happens the same pattern. And so God did away with everything. Noah looked out upon a world in which everything had become nothing. There was water and there was sky. Divided by the sharp line of the horizon, nothing, zero. And Noah was actually seeing the world as it really was, nothing. All is vanity, saith the preacher, Ecclesiastes 1-2, but the book finishes in this way. Fear God, or have God in reverence, revere God, hold God in awe and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Things would have only become something in connection with God, and that was man's purpose, to make the connection between things and God. That's why we have been put here. Trees and mountains Tigers and lions were allusions to a higher reality, the heavenly one. They were intended to lead men to a worship of God himself, not the worship of beauty or of pleasures. Man was made for much, much more than that. Man was placed here on the final day of creation to be the connecting link, so to speak, between creation and the creator. If he failed to do that, his continued existence became redundant. And now think back, think back to the scene beheld by Noah. Water and sky, everything had become nothing. And God was in effect saying, everything is nothing. It always was nothing. It was man's task to make the connection and so turn the nothingness into something. Mankind and all creation had no purpose or reason for existing apart from God. And that remains true today. It crumbled to dust in their fingers, leaving that generation bitter, perverse and violent. They really did become miserable sinners. The beauty of the natural world and that of human society, the painting, the music, family life, children, hobbies, sports, it all became vanity in the shallow pre-diluvian society. God remained hidden and no one sought him except Noah. Things became an endless and meaningless circle of futility leading to destruction. It always does. They underestimated, you know, the corrosive power of shallowness, of superficiality. But actually, shallowness is the anteroom to wickedness. Man's world had become all vanity, all emptiness, and God agreed because they had failed to look deeper, and it was fatal. God had revealed the truth, that apart from him, everything was nothing. The flood is a lesson for us all. The world of our day is right there, you know, as in the days of Noah, so today we're there again. 
The question is, will we, like them, get lost in all the wonders and busyness of this world and forget why we are really here and what it is that gives meaning to everything? It all amounts to nothing, you know, without God. All is vanity, saith the preacher, Ecclesiastes 1 2. Have God in reverence and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. 12 13. Next time, we'll look at what the lessons are for us today. <laughs>